please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Uh, just take a look at uh, the Asian markets right now. No real respite seen for them. Uh, the Nikkei down about uh, six tenths of a percent. A three tenths of a percent gain seen on the Shanghai index, but the Hang Seng that one's opened with a cut of about 330 points. The Korean markets, remember, were sitting with a cut, still sitting with a cut, and that cut has now extended to about half a percent. And the SGX Nifty, while optically it indicates an uptick, remember it compares with Friday futures close of close to around uh, 10,456. And while the optically uh, optical uptick remains, it's still off the high that we saw of 75 points. It's come off sharply by about 50 points. So still indicating a cut of in excess of about 100 points as we start. But let's move on to a CNBC TV 18 exclusive, Anisha. Oh, well, yes. CNBC TV 18 has excess Form 483 issued to Aurobindo Farmers Unit 4. US FDA issues nine observations to Aurobindo Farmers Unit 4. Ekta joins us with more details on that. Ekta, good morning. How severe do these observations look for Aurobindo Farmers? Well, uh, you know, I just want to put the news into perspective for Rubindu Pharma. Like you mentioned that we did manage to access the Form 43, which was issued to the Unit 4, which is basically a sterile injectables unit all the way back on Thursday. Uh, so there are nine observations which have been issued to the plant. Um, remember that this particular inspection took place from the, Feb, from the 12th of Feb to the 20th of Feb, and they include observations such as, say, for example, aseptic processing areas deficient, um, there's equipment and utensils which are not cleaned and sanitized at appropriate intervals. Buildings are used to manufacture uh, stored drugs are not free from rodents, birds, insects, etc. So there is a lot in terms of the observations which have been received. But uh, according to experts, there is no OOS, there's no which is out of specification kind of observations, which is something which the street has started looking at very closely. Plus, there's no data integrity. Plus, there are no repeat observations. Having said that you can't take away from the fact that one there are nine observations two it is to a sterile unit that is where injectables are manufactured and hence has to have the highest level of uh, of uh, you know compliance as compared to any other unit and three while these units while these observations might not categorize themselves in terms of the uh, categories that I mentioned you still have to rectify it and hence that would be something that the street would watch out for closely 25% in terms of sales or ANDAs which are uh, filed from this particular unit and hence it would be important to see what kind of reply Aurobindo has to the US FDA for this particular inspection. All right, Ekta. Thanks a lot for taking us all, uh, taking us through all those details. But let's shift focus to the auto space. Then TVS Motors reported a very strong performance in February, led by a massive growth in the motor motorcycle segment. While Hero Moto reported a higher than expected j a jump of about 20% in total sales. Sonia is here with more details. Sonia, good morning. Hi, Mangalam. Good morning. Yes, there's a lot of news flow in the auto space and a lot of stocks in focus. One of the stocks of today on the upside could definitely be TVS Motor after the stellar performance that the company has posted this time, led by a huge growth in the motorcycle segment. So as you said, the sales were much better than what the street was estimating. It was the fourth consecutive month of an increase in sales. Overall sales growing by 37% year on year. Scooters were up 35%, but the big talking point really is the motorcycle segment and how that has almost doubled on a year-on-year -year basis this time around. Hero Motor Corp is not too far behind either. It's a 20% growth that the company has seen in this month versus an expectation of a 15% growth and the company did say that it was led by a big pickup in the scooter segment. So that's another stock that could be on the upside. Uh, the tractor segment has done very well this time and VST Tillers and Tractors, a smaller company, has reported very good sales both in power tillers as well as in tractors this time around. So I expect that stock to be in the green. On the downside though, Tata Motors has reported weakness as far as the Jaguar Land Rover North America sales is concerned. It's a fall of 2.5% year on year versus a fall of 1% that we saw last month and that's because the legacy products have seen a huge decline. Jaguar sales have fallen quite a bit. New products are doing well but the legacy product fall is steeper than what the street was ex expecting. Also Bharat Forge and Ramkrishna Forgings will be in focus because the North America truck orders just came out and they look pretty healthy for this month as well. Back to you. 
Well, located 25 kilometers from the heart of Mumbai, Thane city has remained quite literally in the island city's shadow. So it came as a pleasant surprise when Thane was chosen as a smart city ahead of capital cities like Bangalore, Shimla and Tiruvannantapuram. But two years after it made to the cut to receive 1000 crore rupees of government funding to transform itself, Thane has gotten any smarter is the question. As part of CNBC TV 18 Smart Cities report card series, Kevin Lee and Ashwani Prorkar uh, travel to Thane to see for themselves whether Thane has transformed any bit into a smart city or not. Home to almost 19 lakh people, Thane is India's 16th most populous city. It's best known for its suburban railway station, which sees over 6 lakh footfalls every day. It's no surprise then, that when its citizens were asked what changes they'd like to see to make Thane a smart city, an overwhelming majority voted for the decongestion of the station. So the municipal corporation came up with this solution. One is new suburban station and second is a multimodal transit hub at existing Thane station. As you have asked about new suburban station, this station will be constructed between Mulund and Thane. It will be just 1.34 kilometers away from Thane. And for this station, we have allocated around 289 crores through Smart City. The existing station is also due for an overhaul in both looks and systems. The entire exercise will cost 845 crore rupees and is scheduled for completion by the end of 2018. But will it actually happen? Thane station was set up in 1853. It's one of India's oldest railway stations and is long overdue for a makeover, which it will get under the Smart City program. However, in the two years since this makeover was announced, only small changes have been implemented at Thane station. There are a few CCTV cameras that have been set up. There are some Wi-Fi hotspots that have been set up, but no big ticket work has started as of yet. As for the new railway station between Thane and Mulun stations, that still remains a pipe dream because forget about the groundbreaking, even the land has not been procured as of yet. But the municipality claims that land procurement is beyond its control. The only issue uh, with the government is about the handing over of the space for construction of the Thane, Thane, new Thane station. Roughly it requires around 14 to 15 acres of land. This land belongs to uh, Health Department of Government of Maharashtra. But this does not mean nothing has happened on the ground in other parts of Thane. For instance, the beautification of two of Thane's popular lakes has been completed, with visitors being greeted with LED lights, illuminated fountains and benches. Parts of the city also have free public Wi-Fi, and some public schools have begun installing solar power panels on their roofs. A few public restrooms have also been renovated, and the city has rolled out a mobile application and a digi card that citizens can use to avail discounts on various government services. The development, however, is a little one-sided. I'm standing in Kisannagar. This is a 70-acre area full of narrow lanes, dilapidated buildings, and a lot of small shops. Now, Kisannagar is all set to get a 4,000 crore rupee makeover under the Smart City program. And while the municipality is confident of making this happen by 2020, the citizens are not. Actually, area is an illegal building. वो होने का देख है कि इधर के पब्लिक का ये फायदा होगा कि सब लीगल ही हो जाएंगे मैं इधर 92 से जा रहता हूं ये बिल्डिंग कलस्टर प्लान का जो आया है ये कब तक होगा ये मेरे को जानना है विद द गवर्नमेंट क्रैकिंग द व्हिप इन द लीड अप टू द 2019 इलेक्शंस द म्युनिसिपैलिटी इज कॉन्फिडेंट दैट थिंग्स विल बी ड्रामेटिकली डिफरेंट अ ईयर फ्रॉम नाउ बट द हार्श रियलिटी इज दैट वाइल सेवरल स्मॉलर एक्सरसाइजेस आर बीइंग कैरीड आउट द बिग टिकट रिनोवेशंस आर स्टिल इन द प्लानिंग स्टेज सो फार out of 30 proposed projects, work on three projects worth 2.2 crore rupees has been completed. On 19 other projects worth 830 crore rupees, work has either just started or is awaiting expressions of interest. That leaves projects worth 4,650 crore rupees that are still just blueprints. In Thane with Ashwini Priyolkar, Kevin Lee. Let's get back to the trade tariff discussion that we were having earlier. US President Donald Trump has said that the US will impose tariffs of about 25% for steel and 10% for aluminum. 
Nigel is here to decode the impact. Nigel, earlier you were talking a little about uh, the impact that it could have, but if you could give us some more details. Yeah, Manglam, you know, the basic details, what they're talking about is they're proposed nearly around 25% on steel imports, 10% on aluminum imports. What is the total quantum that's imported by the United States? Well, in terms of steel, it's nearly around 35 million tons approximately, and they export roughly around 10 million tons. So net, net, you know, they're, they're net importers to the tune of around 25, 26 million tons, which is the country that exports the maximum to the United States? Well, Canada, that's in there with uh, nearly around 6 million tons. So that's the largest uh, contributor out there. South Korea as well, as well as China, between them, they contribute nearly around 4 million tons. So the fear is that, in fact, if that doesn't find its way into the United States, it could come to the other parts of uh, the world, and that could put pressure on steel prices. HSBC is saying, well, the impact on India should be very, very minimal because India accounts for only 2% of the steel exports to United States. So that's what their take is. And the direct impact will be minimum. But in fact, if it's rerouted and it's find its way into other parts uh, of the globe, then that could put pressure on domestic steel prices. And if that happens, they've given a sensitivity uh, analysis. So 1% correction in steel mm -hmm. prices, that's the impact that it could have on FY19 estimated EBITDA. McQuarrie says they're not too concerned with uh, regard to these import uh, tariffs. They believe that uh, it will not have a significant negative impact on global prices. And they're also going on to say that, in fact, scrap prices will move higher. So electric arc furnaces, they basically use scrap. So that could be, you know, blessing disguise for our domestic producers because they basically operate out of blast furnaces. Well, in terms of Hindalco, I'll be watching out for that stock in terms of aluminium. Why? Because any kind of pressure on LME prices, that's what will affect the domestic uh, business. So that's going to be quite important. And uh, in terms of Novelis, yes, they have a direct impact over there. But, um, you know, remember, if the premium goes up, then that, in fact, is a benefit for them. Just want to wind this uh, uh, wind down with this is not the first time that it's taken place. In 2002, 2003, when it was imposed, within 18 months, it was removed. The S&P 500 took a hit of around, uh, you know, 30 percent. Mm -hmm. You had the U.S. Uh, dollar that weekend and also uh, the, you know, the bond yields, bonds did spike up and the yields did contract. Okay, Nigel, thank you so much for that. But let's um, stick to this discussion and go across to Manisha Gupta, who joins us with all the update from the world of commodities. Manisha, good morning. Good morning and thank you so much for that. Well, just taking over from where Nigel left, we have seen uh, steel prices gain up by 20% in this year in U.S., on anticipation of protectionist measures. So, I mean, that is something to keep an eye on because uh, the tariffs uh, increase, uh, tariffs to increase price of imported products to U.S. will mean that the foreign increase or foreign imports to that country will increase. Now, uh, steel and aluminum products account for just 2% of overall imports, but it really is the raw material that is going to impact many of those industries. Just taking up that uh, statement on the U.S. dollar as well, well, the dollar index, while last week did see some good gains, but it has continued to decline right now. So if you look at the dollar itself, that is trading at a two-year lows versus the Japanese yen, you have seen the euro, the Swiss franc, and the Canadian dollar actually gain up versus the U.S. dollar in the earlier Asian markets right now. And it's not just the metal prices which are seeing an impact from the Trump administration announcement expected in this week, but you also have seen the crude oil take a bit of a hit as well. One, of course, there has been an increase in the U.S. weekly inventories and production, and that took the crude oil prices down by 5% in the previous week. But these tariffs do threaten to kill jobs and cancel projects. Now, if you look at the U.S. steel industry, that would fall short of capacity to supply pipeline for various projects that the energy market is taking right now on. So that is where the bit of a threat comes in from. Uh, iron ore prices also are trading at a two-week low. So the market is in a bit of a jittery early Asia uh, on what the U.S. could come out with in terms of tariffs this week. All right, Manisha, thanks a lot for that. The market in the commodities arena is a little bit of uh, little jittery. Well, similar is the case for the uh, equity markets as well, especially the cues coming in from the FNO space. Because on Thursday, remember, the one thing that really stood out during trade was the nifty March futures. That has turned into a discount, and that compares to a 27-point premium. The premium had increased over the last few trading sessions from about 12 points to 27 points, and then it saw selling at the higher levels. That was corroborated by the data that came by last, e uh, I mean, last Thursday evening, where the FIS sold about 700 crores in index futures, unwound some long positions and added some so short positions as well. The short positions were added on nifty futures. 
while the Nifty Bank saw some positions being unwound after underperformance on Thursday itself. So what does this mean? This means that the FIs, they've turned net short on the index futures once again. Now the net long exposure by the FIs is about 49%, which is what it was at the start of the series after a bit of buying that we saw later. They have turned back into the negative territory with 49% longs. The Nifty put call ratio fell from 1.38 to 1.29. That means a lot of calls were written. And if you take a look at the action out there, the 10,500 call, that one added about 7.5 lakh shares for a premium of 115 rupees, 10,700 and 10,800 calls to added a lot of shares in open interest, indicating upside could face some bit of hurdles. In terms of stocks, I'll just watch out for a couple of stocks. Uh, uh, the ones that have entered FNO ban are HDIL and IDBI Bank. JP Associates is out of uh, the FNO ban. And finally, I'll watch out for Fortis because it will cease to trade in FNO from the end of this March. And as, as of uh, what we speak right now, the total open interest is 7.2 crore shares out there. And maybe that, have to, uh, that has to be unbound before the series ends. Okay, Manglam, thank you so much for getting us all that in interesting information from the FNO space. But with that, it is a wrap on Power Breakfast. We leave you with the picks of our bullseye contestants for day one of the week. Bazaar Morning Call will come up next. Our first call is a buy call on MCX for a target of 855, stop loss 734. Second buy would be on no sale for a target of 218, stop loss 196 half. Third buy would be on syndicate bank for a target of uh, 67, stop loss 57. And a solitary sell call would be on steel authority for a target of 75, stop loss 85. First call for today on the buy side is going to be first source solution. And uh, one can create long positions here keeping a stop loss of uh, 51.75 for the target of 58. Next call on the buy side is going to be Godrej Agrovet and stop loss for Godrej Agrovet has to be maintained at 635 for the target of 706. Next call on the buy side is going to be IDBI Bank and stop loss for IDBI Bank has to be maintained at 78.10 expecting a target of 87. The final call on the buy side is going to be Thermax and stop loss, uh, stop loss for Thermax has to be maintained at 1182 for the target of 1314. For the day will be a buy on Wokhart Pharma with a stop loss at 805 and a target of 840. Buy on Oro Pharma with a stop loss at 618 and a target of 635. Adani Enterprises with a stop loss at 204 and a target of 195.